Hello and welcome to Wisdom Talks, the podcast accompanying the Metis Project, the internet portal for intercultural wisdom literature and wisdom practices, to be found on www.metis.ethz.ch. My name is Elian Schmid, and I will be hosting today's talk on philosophy and religion, or rather philosophy or religion, or philosophy as religion, vice versa. In Western history of philosophy, there are many claims that in the European Middle Ages, Philosophy was simply the sidekick of religion, and only later distanced itself from it, even emancipated itself. Philosophizing was then perhaps no more than a support of religious faith. Baruch de Spinoza is considered one of the founders of modern religious and biblical criticism, and a strict rationalist. Ethics is one of Spinoza's most well-known works, and it is structured and presented in a unique and distinctive manner, the geometrical method. What does this mean? Are principles of life presented and proven to us here in the style of Euclidean geometry? Does ethics offer instructions for leading a virtuous and fulfilling life by presenting a structured framework of principles and calculations? This wisdom talk is all about Spinoza and his view on life, philosophy and religion. Billy Gutschel, professor of philosophy and German studies at the University of Toronto, joins us today to explain more about the contemplations of the 17th century Dutch thinker. Also an avid Spinoza reader and analyst, Metis founder and philosopher Michael Hampe joins the conversation. Welcome, Willy Götzschel and Michael Hampe. Thank you. Hello, Ilan. Let us start with a biographical question. Spinoza was expelled from the Jewish community at a young age and placed under anathema. Today, this may evoke images of a philosophical outlaw. But why was Spinoza excommunicated in the first place? And what did this mean? What impact did it have on the young man's life? Could you help us set the stage before we talk about Spinoza's philosophy? Yes, um, this is a question that is still debated, what we don't know too much about it, also we know quite a lot. And the question is, was it uh, interpolitical within the Jewish community? Um, so it was not necessarily for religious reasons only. There may be economic aspects, including it. And what's some important also is that Spinoza was not excluded from Judaism. In Judaism, there's no such thing. He was excluded from the specific Jewish community in Amsterdam. So at some point, Ben-Gurion in the 20th century wanted to um, have the ban cancelled. And it was made clear to him that the only authority who could cancel it would be the rabbi of that specific Jewish community. What we think what happened is that he did not fit in for several reasons. Um, the community was a Marano, had Marano descendants. That, that means um, there were Jews who recently had returned back to Judaism coming from Portugal and Spain. And there were high tensions of orthodoxy in terms of like, what is the right law? And um, there were also more progressive and more traditional rabbis in the community. And there was a moment when uh, Spinoza was not just tolerated. And the main question was like, there was a big fight between him and his siblings, his sisters about inheritance. And he broke the customs law, which was that you use the court and the jurisdiction of the Jewish community. So he went actually to the Amsterdam community and um, won, and actually to uh, humiliate maybe his sisters, he gave them then all their property anyways. And for the Jewish community, that was a very dangerous situation because that meant their own jurisdiction was undermined. And that was deadly. And that is what sort of the more recent mainstream explanations are. We we know that uh, in Judaism, you don't really get like opinions and ideological attitudes are not punishable. And so they weren't attacked, but it was basically he just like threatened or the, let's put it that way the Jewish community in Amsterdam who was already under pressure felt threatened by Spinoza and he's part of a larger history of others who have been banned he has been banned as the most dangerous one because maybe it was theoretically philosophically the most consistent thinker others um, returned back 
the ban was lifted and there's a tragic event if one person who there who he also was a um, he knew who um, then committed suicide at that point because they just couldn't bear this back and forth so it was a community full of tension like in crisis we would say today so is it then a myth that Spinoza as a young man had already taken on pantheism and said that God and nature are the same and uh, that that was the reason for him being expelled from his community? Is it just a myth or could that also have played a role in it? Um, yeah, we know that he had sort of unusual quote-unquote opinions. We don't know exactly whether he said that. There were rumors going around. There were spies who talked to him to elicit opinions to sort of accuse him. But the evidence is so controversial, like it's not clear that we don't know what exactly. What we know is that at that point already, he started to follow his philosophical interests and started to have what they would call unusual opinions. But at exactly at which point that happened is difficult to say, but it was, so he was, Maybe today we would say sort of a person who was conceived as, you know, at the margin of um, like the question was whether he was still fitting in. And the anxiety was that if the Jewish community had a people heretic, so to speak, that became a problem for the Amsterdam authority because they were sort of had to guarantee that their people were, were towing the line. Sounds as if he had started as a Socrates before becoming famous as a philosopher. Yeah, that could be have well been the case that he discussed things with, although he started to become careful, but that he he just was interested in pursuing these questions. I mean, questions. not fitting in and, and being looked yes, at as yes. an outcast. That's what right. an image one has of Socrates right. as well. As right, right. Yeah. And the first kind of outcast thing we can read also in his epistemological treatise when he describes how... So here is a bourgeois. He was not poor, he was not extremely rich, but well-to-do, affluent, we would say, modern bourgeois family, merchant family. Um, and he decides, uh, like other, you know, signs of <laughs> bourgeois family, he's not interested in making more money or any of that. He's just interested in philosophy. And that was, at that point, also itself already a threat for the existential ramification of the Amsterdam Jewish community. So they just felt like that also was, that's not what you do. You, you obey, you go by the rabbis, you are not interested in those like dangerous things. You know, it's, it's the generation um, just that follows Galileo Galilei. People knew what happens if you do things like that, yeah. So this whole excommunication actually backfired in the sense that um, Spinoza became even more famous or famous until today, I guess, after this initial backlash. Right, right. Um, little did they know, of course, that Spinoza will be Spinoza at that point when he left. And uh, th there's still a debate in um, Jewish tradition, like, are you for or against? Like, how do you relate to Spinoza? Is he a menace or is he a representative of modern Jewish thought? But the, uh, the, the image one gets of Spinoza, that he wasn't interested in gathering more money, that he was expelled from the community, reminds one of figures like Socrates and Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein not, not being interested in inheriting uh, his money, but giving it to his sister. So there is a There is a, a certain image of a philosopher being a wise person and impersonating wisdom, not only by writing, but also by, say, his style of life or so. Right, right. No, that's a very uh, important observation because that is already an aspect also of wisdom of life, the idea of um, that his life in a way, and that was for very early um, critics and observers and um, followers of Spinoza, crucial that his life reflects his thought and the thought really reflects his life. And that produced also some of the mythology then that even the first critics like Pierre Bale, who was, it's, it's still not clear, is a critic or a multiplier of the um, 
communication of Spinoza's because it's critical, but that was the only way to also distribute the thought. I said, you know, like this is horrendous atheism, horrendous stuff, but the guy himself is clean and clear in his life. And so that was sort of the intellectual challenge for that time, just like with Socrates, crazy guy, but he didn't really do anything wrong. So, you know, maybe there's something to it. Maybe at this point we can jump directly into the ethics to find out what Spinoza actually said and what we can still gain from that today. So my question is that um, that in the introduction I also said that um, it's a book or a work that works accordingly to geometrical method. And so I would like to know is this a reaction to or a continuation of this early critical attitude towards religion? Right. Um, so there's also, um, there's uh, several aspects to this uh, most geometricus, this geometrical, it's not a method, it's like a way to think. And it's clearly in that way, uh, not traditionally religiously or theologically informed. It's sort of trying to find a sort of a rational, reasonable way to start from scratch and develop. But it's not necessarily, it's not meant as a road a mechanism that you just like follow the lines so easily, but the lines are traced. So there's something liberating or, or emancipatory in this method that it means it's anybody can do it in a way. So it's not mathematics in the way or in the platonic sense of you're only part of the academy if you know mathematics, otherwise stay out. But it's more, um, this is the modern talk or discourse that we all sort of can follow meaningfully without ideological commitments. There are some interpreters of Spinoza, like Kuno Fischer, if I remember rightly, who say that this method, as you said, starting from the scratch, has something to do with the fanatism of the 30 years war that people who had religious confessions and related their ethical convictions to a certain religion become opposed very much to each other. And that mm -hmm. a neutral language, a geometrical kind of presentation was an attempt to, to go away from religion and ethics being connected. Do you agree with this view that Spinoza's ethics has something to do with the 30 years war? Or do you think that's a speculation that cannot be verified? Um, I wouldn't put it too directly, the connection, because historically it's difficult to track. But I think what the gesture or the ethos of this geometrical approach, because even we, we shouldn't, it's not a method in that way. It's, it's a way of thinking is, it is, I think, very anti-theological, that's for sure. And also the QED, the famous, you know, at the end core, quod era demonstrandum, each proof is demonstrated, doesn't mean necessarily that you actually like demonstrate it in what we call a geometrical proof, but it is, you know, I have a proof text and the proof text is not the Bible. The proof text is our thinking, our common thinking. He sometimes says, as I showed you before, as I argued before. So in that way, it's definitely not theological, it's, you can say maybe it is anti-theological, not anti-religious in that way, because we'll get to talk about that again. Um, but th that is one part. And the other part is, which is this moment of the therapeutic or curative moment in, in the ethics, and that we may also touch about when we read the, the, the ethics, something happens like um, with the affects with the reader. And that is like, not you can't compare it with Wittgenstein, but it is a similar idea of this cleansing moment of the thought like frees itself and opens itself up to something new. Um, and so, so I think that's how I would interpret this uh, sort of the rationale behind this geometrical modes or, or mode of writing. 
You just said now um, that he has a specific mode of writing, and you said that also it's not a method, and Spinoza doesn't specifically give guidance in the sense that you should do this or you should do that. But could you maybe elaborate a bit more on how he narrates his book? I mean, how, what does it? How as a reader do you um, read this book? And then could you also maybe illustrate Spinoza's narration with an example? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's something that you could even call a Spinoza effect if you wanted. Um, and it's when you read the ethics or um, some of Spinoza's texts, and it's true also for a few other like great philosophical texts, but Spinoza, I think, engineered it, is that you feel like sort of a moment of excitement, emancipatory liberation, and it's not a coin, and you feel even sort of a connection with the Spinoza kind of thinking, you know, that you have at that moment. And I think that has to do with the way he sets up the writing. And it's not um, so in that way that you, as you proceed in the writing, and you can read the ethics, not just from beginning to end, you may as well just with the critique of a pure reason as Hermann Kuhn said, you may read it backwards to get, um, you know, and you can jump into the middle, but wherever you start, you get enough sort of traction as a reader, the text sort of propels you into a particular direction. And that has to do with the affects that you start to be able to regulate um, yourself as you read it, like you produce this understanding. Spinoza himself talks at some point about the generative process of epistemology, that we produce the definitions, we produce the concepts, and that's how we sort of build the foundation on which we think. And each person has to do it themselves in a way. And I think that is the kind of movement that goes I, let's put it that way, that the writing of Spinoza enables the reader to follow. And that is not an authoritarian direction in which it goes, but it goes in a certain sort of up move. And Schirnhausen at some point wrote this famous Medicina Mentis as a Spinozist, like the, that it's sort of a therapeutical book. And there is something to it. Some people also compare it to some of Freud's writing. I think the better term is curative in that way, because we are not treated in the text, but we cure ourselves through the process, which is in a way also maybe a Socratic moment in some way. In what sense do you think that the topic Spinoza chooses in order to pursue his ethics are important for this feeling? of being connected to him personally, because he talks so much in the fourth and fifth part of the ethics uh, about emotions. He even has a whole appendix where he defines emotions and then there are, there are propositions like hate can never be good and then you get to prove why hate can never be good or there's never too much joy and then he proves why joy is a good thing and one is astonished that a book that has definitions, axioms and proofs talks about these everyday problems humans have, that they have emotions and are overwhelmed by emotions that they do not know how to handle it. And suddenly there is a, such a sober, dry book that talks about these, say, juicy subjects. Isn't that a speciality of the book as well? Yes, yes. Um, that's a very striking feature. And I think that's also those moments where people then, as readers, may immediately connect because they they know what it's about all of a sudden. And this is a movement that is also interconnected with Spinoza's idea that the general and the individual or the, the particular uh, and the universal are interconnected, that they are, they, one is not just a function of the other, but they are mutually interconnected as functions. And he does that programmatically, like um, it's like baked in, as one says in English, or built in, it's integrated. And I think that is also what got him a lot of readers, because this is in a way unique, that here's a person who 
uh, not just talks about these things, but without uh, Nietzsche would say without moraline, without this moral impact, but just in pure descriptions. And Spinoza's one of his famous lines is that where he's different, even different from Machiavelli, is that he doesn't laugh or cry about the affects of human people. He just describes them, and there's nothing to laugh or cry. That's just how it is. And if we don't do it that way, we won't understand it. I think that is very important, yeah. Now, I was wondering, um, you said that he has in that sense a, a very approachable way and the way he describes things is not exclusive. Did Spinoza write specifically for a broad mass? Do you think he wanted to attract a great readership? Or, as you said, he was neutral and he just wrote for himself because he liked writing? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And there's also debates around that. And one thing that's important, which I find fascinating, is that he wrote the way he wrote. And he had is one of the early philosophers in modernity who has running reading group, so to speak. Like he has from the beginning people who read it. And while they say, I have no clue what you're talking here, doesn't make sense. He has also very sophisticated scholars who write him, but he has actual groups in Amsterdam who write back and forth to where he is on the countryside or in Leiden or in The Hague, sorry. And um, that is something where, how should I say it, um, where you can see like one thing he's trying to do is to have a, what we call today as a particular voice, a particular discourse. And it can be sometimes very abstract but you can follow it as a reader. It's not a technical discourse. His writing has, I think like every good writer, has different layers. It can be abstract. If you're very sophisticated, you can get more out of it, but you can also get uh, something out of it. And we do know that what we call like uneducated people, just people who, you know, were not academics, read him and were fascinated with him. As far as I know, there are um, Spinoza societies in many countries, and uh, there's also a Spinoza society in Germany. And what I experienced in this society was that there are people who read him as academics in order to understand what did he take from Descartes, so to say, uh, what what did he take from Judaism, how did he combine, and so on. So they, they take the ethics as a scholarly object. And there are people who read the book and uh, take it as an edifying text. So they read uh, the ethics together and they feel, well, it's difficult to say what is what does it mean to find a text to be edifying. And they don't take it as a religious text, but they have the feeling that their life gets better if they sit together and read it. Can you, how would you describe that as a possibility of reading Spinoza as for your own edification, your emotional therapy? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And um, one thing which I find fascinating is when you go from Spinoza's time to today is that he was also at some point a teenager philosopher in a good way, I should say, that a lot of philosophers read him very early in their teens as teenagers. And then they went on maybe, but there's something that stuck and some others and that is one thing that I always thought was particular, especially in actually the Spinoza Gesellschaft, and some of also the Dutch ones, some of them are, and it's a critical mass of fans. And they may be scholars, they may very be very sophisticated, but there is this emotional, technically one could say excess, but they really like Spinoza. And I have to out myself, I really like him. And, uh, you know, what he does, he, like by reading him, there's something calming, there's something emancipatory, there's something, he doesn't give you all the answers to all the questions, nobody can, but there's something really, uh, it's unique, like liberating, and you can see through the history of the reception that a lot of the interesting philosophers, I mean, uh, the philosophers I think are really important, they grappled with him. They took things from him. Um, yeah. 
So you mentioned reading groups and you mentioned philosophers that were grappling with what he wrote, some like you who really like him. But I would now like to pivot slightly and go into the direction of the big controversy that Spinoza also launched in this sense. And um, so that's the Spinoza controversy, actually, or pantheism, as Michael Hanfa also alluded to before. So the controversy starts with a dispute between the German philosopher Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi and the German Jewish philosopher and theologian Moses Mendelssohn, in whose footsteps thinkers such as Goethe, Herder, Hamann, and Kant followed, and which also had an effect on the German idealists Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, as well as on Heinrich Heine and Ludwig Feuerbach. I am here consciously name-dropping, as I find it quite fascinating how many well, admittedly men, um, were influenced by the Spinoza controversy. So, yes, at this point, I would like to ask you more deeply, what was this controversy about? Why is it still talked about today? And what kind of things did this all launch? Right. Um, thank you. So it's a very rich question. The short answer is this led into German idealism. Um, I'm not so sure how it really led into the German idealism when we go into the history, the Jacobi Mendelssohn debate or conflict or um, spate is also differently seen. So the mainstream narrative was basically Jacobi sort of like was the more sophisticated thinker. Uh, Mendelssohn was sort of the naive enlightenment person. I totally disagree with that narrative. I think that um, what is important to be seen, it's an ideological war at that point. Um, Jacobi tries to sap, undermine Lessing, and Mendelssohn is sort of a side fatality or calamity, but it's about really cutting off the Enlightenment. Kant is drawn in and asked to take sides and doesn't really know, doesn't want to take sides and sort of writes essays where he sort of quotes one side and the other. And so it, it was a big debate. It was a debate for Jacobi. It was not so much a debate whether Spinoza was an atheist. It was the debate if rationalism is going to win, then him, Jacobi's approach of uh, his philosophy of religion is going to lose. And it became a crusade. It became a real crusade. Isn't one aspect of this debate the idea which Lessing might present in his drama Nathan der Weise that all religions have a common core and that perhaps Spinoza explicated this common core? Uh, Lessing does not talk about Spinoza in Nathan der Weise, but he, wasn't he interpreted in that way that he explicated a common core of all religions, of Judaism, Christianity, of Islam, and that therefore the quarrels between the confessions, the religions really have no point? Exactly. No, absolutely. And um, that's often not understood in Lessing's Nathan the Wise. It was not about tolerance. It was about freedom of religion, that um, at that point religion has no truth value anymore. That is not, it has a, another value, the value of faith. And that is what Jacobi could not take. And so it's even more ironic because Mendelssohn knew very well that uh, Lessing had Spinozist inclinations. Like he, both of them had um, also in uh, Mendelssohn himself, you can find very rich resonances of Spinoza. And um, that, so that was amplified then through Jacobi. And I think it's become a screen, a smoke screen for the narratives of the history of philosophy. And we have to basically move away from the old narratives that are still around about how that happened. Yeah. Am I ask a personal question? What do you think yourself? Do you think that, that Spinoza explicated a common essence of all religions and do you personally think that all religions have a common core and that they're just expressing the same in different ways so that there is a wisdom of islam a wisdom of christianity a wisdom of judaism that is the same more or less or do you think that's the wrong perception both of spinoza and the religions um no that's a, a very good question i would try to answer it in this way and that's where spinoza is really fascinating that 
he understands that the sociological function of religion works similar in all religions and that we also all have religious tendencies, that we have a need for religion. And the question is just how we deal with it. Do we deal with it as something like a faith, a belief, or do we give it a truth uh, value? And if we give it a truth value, then we are in trouble. And that's how what he does in the theological political treatise, but also in some ways in the ethics, in a way that he says, well, religion, which is connected with him with imagination, is actually integral, necessary aspect of knowledge. It's not something you can just uh, cut off. Um, the question is how we deal with it. And religion, and he distinguishes that's important religion from theology. As Georg Simmel will do later too, and uh, about religiosity. So religiosity for Spinoza too is sort of a anthropological feature. And there's nothing wrong with it. It gets wrong when the theologians seize it, turn it into weapons. And so for him, any religion also is has specific, is historically to be understood. Um, and has, um, but what I thought was interesting is that he tries to show that exactly Islam, Judaism, Christianity, other forms of religion, they serve the same needs, uh, human needs, and those needs, they have to be served. You cannot, because if you don't serve them in a, in a, a, so a differentiated way, they actually can become very dangerous. So you talked about these different religions and that there's different topics that concern people in general. And since is, this is the Wisdom Talks podcast, I would like to shift it towards the more of a wisdom take. And I have here a short quotation out of the, well, the fifth section out of ethics, um, which I will read briefly because I think it will help us go deeper into, well, is what kind of wisdom can we find here? So at length, I pass to the remaining portion of my ethics, which is concerned with the way leading to freedom. I shall therefore treat therein of the power of the reason, showing how far the reason can control the emotions, and what is the nature of mental freedom or blessedness. We shall then be able to see how much more powerful the wise man is than the ignorant. And as we have often talked about, again, it's about controlling emotions, or at least that's what is touched on. And I wanted to ask maybe the both of you here, how can we interpret Spinoza in a way of how can we lead a, a wisdomous life and do, do we need to be knowledgeable to be wise? I think one aspect of this passage you just read is the relation between reason and emotions. And sometimes we believe that these are two faculties and this section of Spinoza also sounds as if there are two faculties, but in fact, Spinoza believes that if you acquire knowledge and if your reason works, then you're in an emotional state as well. The state of joy, because you're active. But sometimes you, and especially if you are delusioned, if you have wrong ideas, then you get in an emotional stage, in a state in which you are suffering. So I think, and I don't know if uh, Willy Goethe agrees, I, I think one aim of the ethics is to put the reader into a state of being active and therefore experiencing joy. So one shouldn't read the passage the way there is reason and reason suppresses emotions that are irrational, but he, he wants certain emotions to be important in life, namely the joyful ones, and other emotions, namely those that make you suffer, becoming less and less important. But I don't know if you see it the same way. Perhaps you have a different reading of this passage. No, I completely agree. The distinction in Spinoza is to other sort of rationalists, if we actually want to call him a rationalist, is that he doesn't see rationality as the highest control uh, in the chain of command, but um, basically emerging from the affects organically, we could say today. And so in that way, exactly, it's uh, also that's the way he, he doesn't distinguish will from knowledge, which is one of those interesting things. So it's not that in a way, like there's no concept in Spinoza that you control your affects. What you do is you 
get yourself into a state in which state the affects sort of converge naturally with what we could call reason. Um, and that is this moment of joy so that you, so it, it is often compared with a pre-Freudian understanding basically that you get an ability to channel your emotions, which doesn't mean control. And he understood also sometimes uh, you can be, there's no perfect philosopher for him. There's nobody, everybody goes through that. You can imagine also in that way Spinoza being super emotional, but getting to a level which is also not stoic, it's not removed from the world, but it's in within the world, a dwelling inside the world, but going like with, like with the stream in a way, but not being devoured from it. So it's sort of a complex balance that he has. And so that for him would be what the, a wise person would be. There's one term that is important in the fifth path of the ethics. Uh, I don't know if he invented it or if it was already uh, there before him. That is uh, the intellectual love for God. And that shows uh, the way in which he connects rational and supposedly irrational modes of thought, so to say. And, and that's the best state we can be in, the state of intellectual love to God. So, uh, Mr. Gutschel, you said before that Spinoza said you should go with the stream, but not let yourself be dragged away with the stream. So do you think as a kind of guidance for us in life, does it mean we can be aware of what is happening, also acknowledge that we have emotions and that they, they may drag us a bit, but just know that it's okay to have these emotions, but try to go with them, but not be carried away completely? Is, do I understand this correctly? Yeah, that's correct. I think Spinoza gives us a framework to think precisely that we are all not perfect philosophers and that there's no such thing like that. It's also thinking that we are all not perfect fools. Also, some of us think that way, not enough, unfortunately. And um, that is, I think, something that encourages people when you, you, there are moments that you're sad because it's related to your body. There's things that we are not under control. We could say who is not depressed about the environment and many other things today would be crazy, pathological. But then at the same time, we can somehow deal with it by addressing it and understanding those are affects that we have and we can sort of counter steer with the joy. And we also understand that we are not in control of the joy and that we can't just say, decide now we're going to be happy, uh, which is also scary advice we sometimes get from pop psychologists, you know, just try to be happy. Like, what does that mean? So I think that kind of complexity that our lives, whether it's in early modernity or in our current situation is that we share and that we can take from Spinoza. Yes, I very much like this idea as a starting point that we are not perfect fools. So I think I will use this as an ending point and encourage our listeners to take maybe a Spinozian stance uh, sometimes in life when not everything is going well and to yeah, stay calm and know that we cannot grasp joy immediately, but there's still a good chance that we unperfect fools may find a way out of a tricky situation. So thank you very much to the both of you for being in the studio today. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. At this point, I would also like to invite our listeners to follow further wisdom talks, as well as to curiously plunge into the multitude of texts and further podcasts that can be found on our website, www.metis.ethz.ch the internet portal for intercultural wisdom literature and wisdom practices. We also encourage you, dear listeners, to share your own wisdom thoughts with the Metis community via the Metis portal. We have an open call for contributions and welcome your texts or creative contributions on any topic connected to wisdom, be it in text or any other creative form. You can find more information about this and about today's podcast in the show notes below. Thank you for listening and goodbye.
This Metis Wisdom Talk was produced by Martin Münich and supported by ETH Zürich and the Udo Keller Stiftung, Forum Romanum in Hamburg.